Hello everyone and welcome to the second of our Alex Kid in Shinobi World tutorial series. In this video we're going to do two things. First of all we're going to add some enemies into our game and that's going to follow a similar process to adding the player in the previous video. However I will be showing you a very slightly different approach to tackling header files so if, even if you're familiar with header files and you understood the first lesson it's still worth sticking around for. Once that is done in the second half of the video we'll be doing some basic enemy AI using for loops. And in doing that, we're going to expose some problems in the current data structures we're using. And we're going to use that as a jumping off point for the next two or three lessons. Okay, let's start adding the enemies. The first step will be to create an enemy assets folder within the res folder, just as we did with the player assets folder in the previous lesson. With that created, we can now take those enemies. And I've got four of them here today that I've ripped from the original game. And we can stick them in that folder. As you can see here, the number of animations is very small, certainly compared to, you know, Symphony of the Night. And actually even Revenge of Shinobi only has a, a small number of uh, animations, but as, as this is kind of a recreation of an 8-bit game. So maybe in the future we can add more animations depending on how the scope of the game increases. But for now, I'm just going to use the original assets. Okay, now we need to take those assets and we need to add them into our ROM. And to do that, we need to create a new file within that same res folder. And we're going to call it res underscore enemies dot res the code to upload those enemies will look like this so i'm not going to go through it here because i already went through it in the previous lesson and if i now save and compile they'll be loaded onto our rom and just like last week when we did the res underscore player dot res uh, SGDK has automatically created this res and underscore enemies dot h file for us with that done we can now go and we can create our header file and just like with last week we're gonna have to create a h file and a corresponding dot c file so the dot h file the main header file goes in the ink folder up the top and then the dot c file goes within the src folder Let's use the player.c and the player.h files we created last week as a little template. So first of all, player.h. So we're going to copy and paste these uh, boilerplate code bits of code here. And remember, these are just to stop the uh, the content of the file being being copied over many different times in the in our program. But we're going to have to change the name of that instead of player player dot player underscore h. It needs to be enemies underscore h, i.e. the same name as we gave to the h file. I'm going to use the same lazy way of copying some of the boilerplate code from the uh, player.c. So remember, we're going to have to include the header file within our enemies.c. Um, so we're going to copy and paste that, that include. But of course, instead of including player.h, we're going to be including enemies.h. And what we've done here is the basic template of creating header and their corresponding C files. So for those of you who were first exposed to header files for the first time in last week's lesson, I hope you're going to get a bit more comfortable with them. Just as we included SGDK as well as the um, the player res folder with into our uh, player.h header file, we're going to do the same for our enemies file, but of course we're going to include the res underscore enemies file instead. At this point, it'll be a good idea to just save and compile just to make sure everything's working. It looks like everything's fine with our um, program here. At the beginning of the video, I did say that we're going to look at an alternative way to do header files, and that's what I'm going to show you here. So instead of writing this um, kind of two lines at the top and then this end if uh, line at the bottom, we can instead use this. We can use this hashtag pragma once, and we're going to use it. We're to use this at the very top of the of the file of the header file rather than anything at the bottom and as you can see this is a lot less verbose it's a lot easier a lot you don't need to write a specific file name or anything and the previous method i showed you before is more it's definitely more standard within c uh, within the c language but this one seems to work fine with sgdk anyway so i think in future we'll just use this method instead Okay, with the header files all done, we can now go ahead and we can start adding enemies onto our screen. We're again going to be using the um, the, the player.h and player.c files we created last week as a little template because we also want to create some um, functions to add the enemy so we can then put that into main. Since we already have uploaded four different types of enemy onto our ROM, let's create four actual enemies to display on the screen here. 
So first we're going to add the sprites both in the header file and also the C file and don't remember in the in the header file we put xn before the sprite and in the C file we don't need to do this we can delete the xn and just as when we created player we created a separate function to do that we're going to do the same with the enemies here so we're going to set up the palette and then we're going to add the sprites one by one. This time we're going to be using PAL2 rather than PAL3 and actually all of the um, the enemy graphics here they all use the same palette so it doesn't matter if we just use the basic ninja graphic to take the palette data from. We're going to take this new create enemies function and we're going to call it just after we create the player in main.c and of course don't forget to include our enemies.h file in the main.c as well. If we now save and compile we will get this result. And as you can see, all four of our enemies are now successfully loaded onto the screen. Okay, now on to the second half of our lesson, which will be doing the enemy AI. First of all, I want to quickly change the names we've given to these enemies. So I started counting at 0, 1, but I think it's normally best in program to start at 0, 0. So let me just change that quickly here. For the basic AI, what I want to do is just to move the enemies each frame. So instead of hard coding the um, X and Y coordinates here, we're going to set create some variables, X and Y variables for each of the enemies. And then we're going to change these with each frame. And again, just as with the other variables, we include the X in the dot H and we remove it in the dot C. And now I'm going to make sure that we use those values within when we create our enemies. So I'm going to replace these with the enemy Y and enemy C's. And of course, because they're fixed 32 numbers, we need to do the conversion to integers. Remember, this is slightly different in the, ver the new version of SGDK I'm using. It used to be fixed 32 to int. That was how you converted the fixed 32 to integers. But since I think it's, I think it's since the latest version of SGDK is now changed to F32 underscore to int. And of course, rather than having these numbers, I'm going to need to put the enemy X's and enemy Y's in here instead. With that finally done, we're now going to add the X, Y coordinate numbers within the uh, variable declaration. Let's quickly save and compile to make sure everything's okay and it looks like everything's fine, so let's continue. In order to manage the enemy AI, we're going to create a new function. So in the H file, we're going to create the function prototype and let's just call it manage enemies. And then for the actual body, the actual code for the uh, function itself, we're going to write it in the corresponding .c file. And the code itself is going to be very, very straightforward. We're simply going to uh, move the enemies at each frame of the screen. So let's just take these enemy X values and we're simply going to iterate over them, just add or minus some uh, coordinates. And since the sprites are now going to be moving, we're going to, of course, need to update them on the screen for each frame. And for that, we simply use the SGDK function SPR underscore step position. In order for that function to take effect, we're going to need to call it within our game loop. So let's just put it here just before the sprite update. And after saving and compiling, you should get this result. While our code is achieving the intended result, if you look at the code more carefully, you'll see that there's lots of repeated step. We're doing the same thing over and over again. And that normally indicates that you're probably better off using a for loop. And of course, if we're going to use a for loop, we also need to create arrays to store the data in. We did use arrays and for loops very extensively in the recent lesson on tile scrolling. So make sure you check that out if you need a refresher. You can see I've created an array in our .h file here. So we need four values in that and it's going to be all fixed 32 values. So in our actual C file, we're going to need to put the values into this and we can just copy the values that we used in previously for the separate variables, the enemy 00 to 03. We can now scroll down to our manage enemies function and we can use a for loop to iterate through that array. The benefit of for loops is instead of having to uh, perform the same action or same part of same bit of code over and over again for as many enemies as you have, we can simply have one for loop and we can write one single piece of code to achieve the same effect. 
This should remind you of the basic structure of for loops. So we define three parameters. First of all, we define a variable, the counter variable, which we call i. We make it u8 and make it equal to zero. So we start counting from zero. And then the second one is how many times we count. So we count until we get up to four, then we stop. So we count zero, one, two, and three. And then the final one is how much we iterate each uh, each loop, which will just add one to the i each loop. You can add two or three if you want, but most of the time we're going to be adding one time per loop. So in the end, we'll iterate through this array four times, zero to three. And each of those times, we're going to add a certain value to the x value. And as a reminder, we access values within an array within that little square bracket. So we have four values, zero to three. And in the in the for loop itself, we can simply replace that number with an i. So when the i goes through from three to zero, it's going to change each value within the array in turn. As a for loop is written at the moment, it's simply going to make each value equal to 10. But of course, we want to add a certain value to it each frame. So 10 is a bit too far. So let's change it to 1.5. We won't need to add anything to these old values anymore because we're using the array now so we can get rid of that and of course we need to actually change the values within this set position here so instead of using those old values we need to use the array values instead looking at our newly compiled rom you can see that the for loop is working however there's a slight problem we've had a bit of a downgrade since last time and that is that now all of the enemies are moving at the same velocity, they're moving at the same speed, 1.5, whereas before they all had their own different speed. The solution to this problem will be to create a new array, this time with the velocity of each enemy in it. I'm going to make these values a little bit different from last time, so some are going to be very fast, some are going to be very slow, some moving to the left and some moving to the right. And then instead of using this fixed number in our for loop, we can simply use that array. And before we save and compile, I'm just going to clean up our code a bit. So we're not using these old enemy X's anymore. So I'm just going to get rid of them. And after saving and compiling, you'll see that now our enemies are all moving at different speeds according to their position in the uh, velocity array. At this point, we could, of course, keep adding new and new arrays for each attribute that an enemy might have. So an obvious one would be to be to create an array for the Y coordinates. But we could also do other things. For example, enemies are going to have hit points. So we can make that an unsigned 8-bit integer. We can call it hit points. And, you know, I think in GG in uh, Shinobi World, in our Alice Kid version, uh, most enemies die on one hit. But the bosses certainly have hit points. So we could include that. And, of course, once the hit points are all out, we could create a, a boolean, whether they're alive or not, or whether they've already been killed by the player. And as we look down at our enemy creation code, as well as the manage enemies code, we can see that we're still repeating the same uh, functions over and over again. So we could include these in the for loop too, but we need to create an array of sprites. While this approach technically would work in most circumstances, as you can imagine, having to create an array for every single attribute your enemies have will uh, quickly become very unwieldy so the code won't look very good and it won't work very well. Thankfully the C program language has a way for us to create our own data types. For example we could create a new data type called enemy and then we could create an array of those enemies and each of those data types could have um, many different bits of data attached to them. So for example the x coordinates, y coordinates whether they're alive or dead and their hit points and so on. And that is precisely what we'll be doing over the next two or three lessons. Okay, so that'll do for this lesson. Thanks very much for watching. If you're interested in this type of content, don't forget to subscribe. I'm interested in this. And if you'd like to support me further, I have a Patreon account with lots of exclusive goodies, for example, uh, sneak videos and code and demos to download. So any support will be much appreciated. You won't go unrewarded. Until next time. Farewell.